and uh, I'm going to uh, welcome to uh, introduction to astronomy. All right. So now we are officially started. So let me uh, give you a um, uh, my screen with my little webcam on, and then I'll try to uh, sort of walk you through what this course will be about. So if you uh, if you have arrived late at this course, then don't worry because uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to put the entire video, all the videos that I make in this course, they will be put out on YouTube so you can watch them as many times as you want. The idea of streaming is really that you will have the opportunity to ask me questions that normally would not uh, would not be possible in a YouTube video. And, and the idea behind that is that I, I've taught a little bit in uh, elementary schools, um, roughly a year or so, two years perhaps. And uh, then I've uh, taken a uh, more education, if you will. I'll try to. I I gotten from uh, from my, it's called a professional bachelor here in Denmark, and then I took a master in physics and astronomy from the University of Copenhagen, and that sort of gives me the capacity, if you will, to teach at high schools. So I've taught in a couple of high schools here in Denmark. Not 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 much in sort of time. It's uh, roughly a little little more than uh, roughly uh, a year or a month or something like that. Uh, but but after that, all this uh, COVID uh, shit, sorry, <laughs> all of this COVID thing began to pop up and made things uh, turn around uh, completely for me and my family. And also, uh, my family needs the the, fa the needs that, especially my son. I have a son who is uh, nine, and he uh, was recently diagnosed with autism, so he's autistic, he's an autist, and that means that he has some, some needs that I will try to uh, to give him, and, and one of the needs here is that uh, it is that I stay at home, That that's one of the, the things about it, but obviously I would like to use my knowledge, I would like to use the, uh, the knowledge and, and gain some more experience in teaching, and I thought, why not try do it here in... Uh, here on Twitch. I think Twitch is a good setup because you can come online and you can ask questions. Now I will state some rules and, and if you are new to this kind of course here, it's important that you know my rules at least. This is just like an ordinary classroom, meaning that if you are late, at least later than I am, then I won't repeat things. You would have to uh, revisit the video, see it again either on Twitch or on YouTube in order to, to gain that, get that knowledge back. But other than that, I will help you as much as I can uh, to, uh, to gain knowledge about one of the subjects that I have, that I find to be one of the most interesting subjects in, in, uh, in science in the world. And that is, of course, uh, astronomy. So this first lecture here is going to be sort of an introduction to the course. I'm going to tell you a little about a little bit about the books that I will sort of go forth from, and uh, I will um, tell you what the content of the course will be, and sort of give you an overall idea of what, at least what I think astronomy is. So uh, let's uh, let's let's start with that. So, uh, yeah, I'll go back here and because I didn't prepare a slide for that exactly. But uh, l let, me, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Like I, like I said, my name is Michael Hansen. I am, just like it says, I am 38 years old. So I'm an old man. <laughs> uh, I have a master's degree in physics uh, with specialization in astronomy. From the University of Copenhagen, and like I said, I said I taught a couple of of high schools and also taught uh, elementary school kids. So I have sort of a some some insight into it that's sort of wider than the normal high school teacher that you would usually uh, usually bump into. And um, I uh, have a wife who is uh, a medical doctor, and I have two kids: a son who is nine and 
a daughter who is four. Like I said, my son has been diagnosed with autism. So, well, if there's anything else you would like to uh, to uh, know, then you can just ask. But try to keep the questions primarily about um, the content of of the 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 course that we have, and not so much of me personally. It's more an opportunity for you to ask questions here, because this is sort sort of an introduction to it. All right, but that's me. That's why I am, and uh, now you know the sort of the knowledge that I have that I will try to uh, to bring to you. All right, so let's uh, get on with it. So the first thing I would like to to tell you about is uh, what do I think astronomy really is? Because if you want to learn about astronomy, maybe it's a good idea idea to have sort of an an idea of knowledge. Of what is astronomy? So I think that we can sort of um, define astronomy more as well. Obviously, it's it's a collection of knowledge. It's it's, it's sort of a subject within science, natural science, where we have knowledge. We have books with knowledge. We have articles. We have uh, astronomers. We have researchers and all that who who also has knowledge, and and they, they their knowledge is in their head and. They put it on paper and then other can read it. So so it's sort of a a shared shared commodity of uh, of knowledge. But other than that, you can also say that astronomy is also in a, a method in itself. And and one thing is that that astronomy is is measurements and classifications and mappings of stellar objects. And and I said mapping, but it's mappings of stellar objects. That means that it's a way to sort of look up to the sky and sort of find out, sort of decide what is out there. Because if you want to describe something, then it's a good idea to know what is actually there. So uh, that's one thing. Astronomy is also the understanding and explaining the physical properties of stellar objects. Well, I said stellar, I, I should probably more have said uh, universal objects. But it's 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 a... We need to be able to understand, and we also need to be able to explain our understanding to other people of the physical properties of these objects that we find in space. Not necessarily stellar objects, but frankly, the, the most part of what we see in the universe is actually stars. So stellar objects is not completely wrong, but it's just a little bit imprecise. And finally, I would sort of personally say that there's sort of two levels that we can sort of define astronomy as. There is professional astronomy that's conducted by astronomers, by scientists, by researchers and all that in their big telescopes and with huge computers they can do models. But then there's also a very uh, quite large community of amateur astronomers and sometimes they overlap a little bit because what you could sort of say is that professional astronomy is about bringing forth knowledge of astro astronom astronomical objects phenomena amateur astronomy is more the sort of visual observation and perhaps even the, the what we call pretty pictures of what is what is out there but professional astronomers do also actually make pretty pictures because they need to sort of have different ways to to uh, to uh, legalize the amount of money that they use. Uh, f most of the astronomy in the world is is uh, funded by governments, and governments they get their money from the people. So, in order to sort of uh, justify that, professional astronomers use to some extent a relatively big part of the the uh, the government's uh, budget. They need to uh, they need to sort of uh, justify that, and one way to do that is to show pretty pictures to the pu to the public because most people can read an an article from something like astrophysical journals or anything like that, but if they have haven't any training in the subject, then their sort of deeper understanding of of what is in that article will probably be a little bit limited honestly 
But if anyone can can sort of marvel over a beautiful picture like the one of uh, that Hubble has taken of the um, of the uh, uh, Andromeda Galaxy or the deep fields uh, observation, all that. So definitely, that's that's one thing that professional astronomers also do. And they also need to sort of uh, visualize what they do, uh, the, the, the observations that they have. But there's also recently been given the opportunity for amateur astronomers to sort of slide into the professional arena where they can buy um, real, uh, for example, um, standard um, filters to make... Uh, um, Magn magnification um, classifications and also quite recently it has been possible for amateur astronomers to buy um, slit uh, spectrometers which give gives amateur astronomers a whole new way to sort of do uh, do uh, do science as an amateur astronomer but we will be talking more about what uh, photometric uh, classifications, that was the word I was looking for, phot photometric classifications and spectrometric classifications are. So, books and contact, yes. I have based this course, uh, I did base this course when I taught it in, in Denmark on a Danish book. And uh, I taught it between 2018 and 19, so it's a, it's a couple of years ago. And um, the book that I used, if there are any Danish students, uh, high school students watching this um, stream or this video on YouTube, then you can uh, use uh, the book called uh, De Leone Universe. And again, it shouldn't say De Leone Universe, it should say De Leone Universe by Henrik and Helle Stubb, and obviously it's in Danish. <laughs> uh, for the uh, native English uh, members that, that are watching this stream slash video on YouTube, you can, you can download, um, I think it's the 11th or 8th edition, I'm not sure, about a book called Universe by Kaufman and Freedom, uh, Freedom Friedman. Obviously it's, it is in English, but... It is in college level, so it's a it's a bit higher level than what I will be going into here. But but you can use it nonetheless. And finally, if you have questions for me, for example, if you watch this on YouTube and you have things that you would like to have explained a little bit more, perhaps even things that you would like to like for me to sort of take up in the next stream, then you can. I have created this mail here, so you can mail me at mics slash observatory at dktv slash mail dot dk so that's the mail you can always get in contact with me but please try to keep this relevant for the course because that's the reason i created this mail in the first place all right so here's one thing that you might really want to know some very important for you and that is um what is the content of these lectures that we're going to go through so I expect the lectures be, to be roughly, perhaps take r roughly a year, actually. Maybe maybe less, depends on how much time we're going to spend on each lecture and, uh, yeah, all sorts, of, all sorts of stuff, what I put in and take out and all that exclude from it. But in overall, what we are going to talk about in this course is going to be the night sky and the solar system. So that's sort of the the hands-on part of the uh, the. Uh, the, uh, the course that is what you can see when you just go outside and take a look at the sky when you look up what can you see what is there and also how do you orient yourself on the night sky how do you find your way around because obviously when you look out the most of the stuff that you're going to see will be stars and so you need to have sort of a system in order to find a way to figure out how to navigate on the sky then we're going to talk about one of the biggest subjects that will be in this course, and that is obviously about stars, because there are stars all over. I would argue that uh, the most of the content that we have here in the universe, if we exclude dark matter and dark energy, 
that is star stars is definitely the the most uh, um abundant source we have uh, stuff that we have here in uh, in the universe then we're going to take a look at, at a relatively also a relatively big subject it's going to be planetary systems and exoplanets <clears throat> exoplanets has exploded the last 10 20 years or something like that going from knowing uh, two to three verified exoplanets to suddenly knowing over a thousand verified exoplanets and it has also sort of uh, total sort of changed the way that we actually look at our own solar system and and how the solar system was created so so that is one interesting thing about exoplanets we're going to talk more about that here both how planetary systems are created but also what is exoplanets how do we detect them and also something like that and finally we are going to take sort of the the biggest perhaps biggest subject in the course <clears throat> the also the one that sort of uh, spreads over the the widest area of different knowledge systems in in astronomy and that is going to be the near and the far universe so that's going to be sort of the the most outreaching part of the course that we can imagine so we're going to look at uh we we looked at stars so we're obviously going to look at stellar clusters what are stellar clusters why do they form do we know why they form and 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 similar questions will i'll try to answer there then we're going to look at obviously well if you take <clears throat> if you take all the stars and you take all the stellar clusters then they're usually collected in a bigger collection of stars that we call galaxies so galaxies is sort of a bigger collection of stars and planets and all that we live in a galaxy called the milky way and the nearest galaxy that we have to well if you exclude the uh our neighboring or our sort of a uh, um follow galaxies i can't remember the, the, the name of them uh but but if you exclude that oh yeah the uh the uh, little and uh, big magellanic clouds i think they're called if you exclude those then the andromeda galaxy is the closest galaxy that we have to to our galaxy and then again we can we can take it a step up we can take it a notch up because we, when we have stars in clumped together in clusters we can also put we can put those into galaxies but we can actually also take galaxies and put them into galaxy clusters and galaxy clusters was one of the subjects that i uh, well mainly actually the subject that i wrote my master thesis about and finally we had sort of the perhaps the more philosophical the, the more um sort of um uh yeah how do you just put it you you cosmology is really about figuring out how was this entire universe that we live in created why was it created not not a not a why as did someone have an intention of creating it but more why of of how actually how it was created um what is its content what is its future and and, and all those things will we will look at in cosmology cosmology is uh, well all of these subjects are open subjects that still undergoes active research and cosmology is a very big subject because it's sort of spans a very wide area of different ways of looking at the universe so uh, yes and uh, if you have noticed this little uh, thingy here it's my uh, hotel setup for when i'm doing games so yeah it's i know it's perhaps it's a little in the way but i can't really move it around in a because my desk is not that big so yeah um yeah so that's the content of these lectures so let's take a look at uh, professional astronomy and i think i think perhaps the best way the best place to start talking about professional astronomy is to talk about one of the observatories that i has had have spent a week at as a part of a course 
at uh, the uh, University of Copenhagen. So this is the uh, Nordical Optical Telescope and the Nordic Optical Telescope. It's a 2.5 meter wide uh, main mirror and uh, the secondary mirror is up here somewhere. Uh, it is used actively for research and uh, it is by any standards uh, albeit perhaps a little bit small compared to other telescopes. It's a fully modern telescope able to do modern research. And just to compare the size of this telescope, you can see here, here, here on the back, we have all the different instruments that uh, is uh, is put on to the uh, to the <laughs> to the telescope. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but somewhere on here we have an instrument called Alphosk, and on that they're sitting a CCD chip. And connected to that CCD chip somewhere, I think it's around here because there's a valve here. We have uh, um, liquid nitrogen to uh, cool down the the chip. These wires that you can see here, most of some of them at least, goes from uh, an instrument called FIES or FIES, which is a fiber-fed um, a shell spectrometer. Uh, and obvious, that, that means that the light that we get from the telescope actually goes out to another building where the, uh, the, the uh, spectrometer is in and all the instruments regarding that. And uh, this is a fully manned telescope with the uh, computer assisted and all that so you can, you can watch several hours on the same object with, with this telescope here. This is the uh, control panel, <laughs> control area. So you can see we have, uh, this is the guide screen. Uh, I think both of these shows the uh, guide star. So what telescopes does, because you, you can't make telescopes that are, can't make um, technology, uh, mechanics, mechanical objects, um, gears and all that, that is fine-tuned enough so that you can, that is precise enough so that you can stay on the same star, the same area of the sky, exactly this the same amount of time. Professional telescopes can probably do it for a much longer time than amateur uh, telescopes, but it's it's a, it's a fact for both telescopes that they need active guiding in order to uh, in order to uh, track an object precisely. Also, an, a telescope like uh, the Nordic Opti Optical Telescope, because the main mirror is so big, like I said, it's about two and a half meter. You don't make that kind of mirror out of glass like you would do at a normal amateur telescope. You then make it out of a thin plate of metal, for example, aluminium or perhaps steel. No, not steel, perhaps iron, some, some metal that is solid, but still bendable. So, uh, and then you, uh, you, you sort of coat the surface with aluminium, just like a mirror, an ordinary mirror. So an ordinary mirror, when you go out and set your hair or whatever you do, is actually uh, a piece of glass where they have coated it on the front with aluminium and then glass again in order to give that reflection. And besides the, the precision, it is exactly the same way you do it uh, with 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 a with a with a main mirror on a telescope, but what you need you need this mirror to be solid, right? You can't just put put in forth this uh, with this bended metal plate with aluminium top. You can't just put it inside, hanging on something because then it would bend and and be very. It wouldn't have this shape that it needed in order to to observe. So instead, they put sort of small um, hydraulic actuators underneath the mirror. And that has two advantages. The first is obviously that they can keep the mirror in its right form. The other is that when, it, when, when the telescope is looking at this star here, then it can actually sort of adjust these actuators underneath the mirror in order to sort of... Um, rule out some of the, the um, disturbances that we get from, from, from the sky. Because uh, when, when we look at a star, if you go out and look on, on, on the stars at a nice bright day, 
you'd probably notice that many of the stars are flickering, sort of like almost changing their color or looking like a, sort of a, a candlelight when you blow a sort of a soft wind at it, you'll see it sort of flickering around. And that is simply because we have several layers of air and, and water moving past each other, creating turbulence with <laughs> creating turbulence within, th within them. And these different layers will bend the light in different directions. And because the air is constantly moving, this bending will change all the time. And that is why the, the air is, uh, is uh, flickering, uh, sorry, the stars are flickering around. If you take uh, a telescope, when you take an image of a telescope, sorry, when you take an image with a telescope, with a camera on, then what you do is that you have sort of a, let's say, compare it to a, uh, a mirror, a DSLR. So when you push the button on your DSLR, the shutter will open, let in light, and close again. The same happens when we have a telescope like this, a professional telescope, but then we will say, well, we need five minutes of exposure, so the shutter will open and keep it open for five minutes, and then it will shut again. That can be electronic shutters, that can be mechanical shutters, but the, the principle is the same for both of them. If you did instead, so instead of taking these five minutes, and you have this uh, round star with a size, and you have to remember, you have to know that all stars, when you look at them, are points in the sky, they are dots. But instead of taking these five minutes, let's say you took 500 or 5,000 small exposures of this star, then you would see that the star would change its position all over these images. And what happens when you sort of um, take these five minutes is that all of these motions of the star will sort of make a statistical round shape because they sort of move in roughly the same direction all the time. They don't go all the way around, but they sort of stay in the same general area. And therefore you get this round, round star. But in order to sort of try to alleviate from some of that disturbance, what these professional telescopes would do is that they will look at this star and then when the star moves, the mirror, main mirror will change. It's just slightly, but in order to sort of uh, compensate for that movement. So this is one of the special images that we took uh, when we had this uh, course at the Nordic, Op Nordic Optical Telescope. We have this little special thing here which is actually a gravitational lens. And to my best knowledge, it still really hasn't been explained what this round shape, as you can see it here, it looks sort of like a, a hummer or a crab. But this part here, this is part of the, um, the lens. This, this is not, this is a galaxy or a star. Well, it, uh, it's suppose it is a galaxy. And this down here is also part of the lens. So these two parts here, of the same and, and why it has this round shape I don't know we never found out so here we have instead so this is let me just go back this is a normal image just when you open the shutter for the uh, the uh, CCD and then you get in light and then you can sort of calibrate <coughs> sorry then you can calibrate it and this is the image that you get you can also do another thing. You can put a slit in front. So this is a, 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 a slit with a spectrometer in front. So this is the same object as you see here, but in spectrometry. And as you can see, this part here and this part here, they are in the same area um, of, the, uh, of the spectrum. And this long line that you see here, is this galaxy that you saw in the middle. So you can sort of imagine that what you see here is, well, it's not like you sort of took the other image and lay it down, but this is sort of, you take all the different uh, colors, if you will, um, wavelengths that comes from these, um, um, objects, and then you sort of slit them out. <clears throat> 
So each of these lines represent a distinct wavelength. And as you can see, this, this area here is very bright for these two objects. And that is, uh, well, this is actually uh, for, for, <laughs> for a quasar. But, but if you took an image of this, you would see that these two lines would pop up in a, in a very specific place. So you would, you would take, not for these two objects, but you would take sort of this instead. And then you would see this line pop up very distinctly. And then you would take this out as well. And then you would see that this would pop up as well. So this represents a very specific wavelength. And I think it was oxygen two or three or something like that, that we, that we found out. And when you, when you, one of the reasons that we do this is that when we know the wavelength, for example, we have a peak here. When we know, and a peak here, and a peak here, when we know what sort of um, um, atom or molecule, now in this case it's probably atoms, so if we know which atom it was that made this wavelength here, that made this sort of uh, light emission here, we can take this <clears throat> and then we can compare it with the same, the same um, atom, but in the laboratory. And when we know the wavelength that this atom emits in the laboratory, and when we know it well from th the object that we have observed. Sorry, phone. Sorry about that. There was a phone call. Uh, I'll take it later. So if we uh, if we have this uh, wavelength here, we uh, we can compare the two. And when we know these two and we compare them, then we can actually find out what the uh, the redshift what the redshift of this subject is. All right, and here we have, uh, this is a different kind of spectrometry. This is the fierce uh, high-res spectrum. So I'm not going to go into the technical details about how you actually make a, um, a high-res spectrum of this and how you, uh, you sort of uh, get it out like this. But as you can see, this is from uh, Wolf Ray Star called uh, WR136. And as you can see, compared to this one, well, it is okay detailed. It goes from 4,000 roughly to 7,000 or 6,800, something like that. This one goes from, I think it must be 2,500 all the way up to 8,000 or 9,000 um, angstrom in wavelength. So, and as you can see, the lines are very, very finely scaled. I wouldn't even be able to get to to show how fine scaled such a high res spectrum uh, could be uh, if I didn't split it up like this. So this is all of what I've told you about here is um, spectrometry and uh and 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 visual observations is in the uh, visual spectrum uh, or the the light spectrum if you will of the electromagnetic spectrum but we have other kinds of of light if you will other kind of of emission that we can that we can observe and one of them is done by the uh, atacama large millimeter array which is done in in radio waves and as you can see, this is a huge area of different telescopes put together. And one of the big advantages of radio telescopes over, for example, um, um, optical telescopes is that radio telescopes can be sort of combined together into what we call uh, interferomet interferometry, meaning that all of these telescopes here can be combined and work as one telescope. That means, theoretically,
that we could take a telescope and put it at the moon. And we could take a telescope and put it on the other side of Earth. And then we could use, combine those telescopes, those two radio telescopes together. <clears throat> and that would be equivalent in the resolution, that is, of one telescope with the diameter of the distance between the Moon and the Earth. So that would be a telescope with a diameter of 300,000 kilometers, almost 400,000. That would be something, right? So, but, but the general idea is here that we can spread these radio telescopes out over a large area. And then when we combine them all together, it would be sort of like having one huge telescope with this uh, radius or this diameter here. So one of the things that uh, this uh, as a Camelage Millimeter Array did was that they observed protostars and they actually found evidence of a of a of a planet here inside here all of these rings that you can see here are most likely newly formed planets that are sort of uh, gobbling up all of this dust and material that is around here and the same ring here but the ring inside here where you can see is this black one here is most likely a planet that is very very close to the uh, this uh, protostar here there are also other kinds of older telescopes that the Ad Camelage Millimeter Array is a relatively modern kind of radio telescope. But one of the advantages that, that the scientists, that astronomy, astronomers quickly realized was that contrary to, uh, to, uh, to optical telescopes, you can almost make um, radio telescopes with arbitrarily large sizes. And again, when we then combine these telescopes together in interferometry, we can get even larger sizes. And, and the reason why we want telescopes to be bigger and bigger and bigger is that the bigger the main sort of dish or the main mirror of a telescope is, the more light it can uh, collect, meaning that if you open your sensor, it will take a short amount of time for it to be sort of filled up, if you will, the larger the main mirror you have is. So it's sort of like a, you can, you can think of it as a kind of a photon bucket. The bigger you make the bucket, the more rain you can collect. It's the same principle here. And that goes both for the main mirrors, but it also goes for the pixel sizes on the sensors themselves. Again, this is sort of a more technical detail that I will not go into very much in this course here. One of the telescopes that we sort of found out that was pretty smart to build was the Hubble Space Telescope. And, and you may ask yourself, why is that? Why, why put a telescope in space? Well, the answer is actually quite obvious. When we look at the sky, one of the biggest hindrances for us in getting high resolution, high detailed images is the sky. So despite it providing us with the air that we need to breathe, the oxygen that we need to survive, it is also a very large hindrance in, in order for us to get, um, in order for us to get good data, good optical data. Uh, radio telescopes, they don't have the same problem because they work at different wavelengths. So they can't be obscured, but it, instead of having the sky doing the, 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 the air in, in the atmosphere doing it, it will probably be a very thick layer of clouds that will uh, make that hindrance. So NASA found out that it would probably be a very good idea to build a telescope and then put it into space, because if you look past the fact that a telescope in orbit around the Earth will have some problems observing the same area, some of the parts of the sky, the same area, all the time. It's a very big advantage that that telescope is free from the, uh, the, the night sky. Modern technology on telescopes where we correct 
for both the uh, the uh, the disturbances in the atmosphere on the main mirror, but also on the secondary mirror, has made telescopes able to get images with a quality, a resolution that can compare with the one we got from uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. But the Hubble Space Telescope is still the main go-to telescope if we need high resolution, long um, exposure images of objects on the sky. One other wavelength that we can... Uh, one other... One other wavelength that we can get in, that we can sort of try to collect in uh, in, uh, in in astronomy, is called X-ray. It's also part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but it's a much harder uh, wavelength to collect. And the reason is that X-rays are they are very um, oh, what do we call it? They are they are. They are hard to stop. Let's put it like that. Obviously, you can take a lot of lead, and then you can stop uh, an an X-ray. But but we don't want to stop the X-ray here. We just want to deflect it. So if we did just like with the Hubble Space Telescope, put in a uh, uh, some gold uh, f uh, aluminium um, combination in the bottom, just like an ordinary mirror then the, uh, the x-rays would just fly right through it, nevertheless. But what they have done instead is make these conical shapes almost like a beehive shape. So we have all these thin plates of gold foil collected together. And that means that when the x-rays come into, for example, this telescope here is the Chandra telescope, instead of sort of bouncing it, bouncing it in the other direction like a normal telescope would do. Instead, what they do is that they slightly bend the X-rays inside here. So it's sort of a, instead of having it like a mirror where the light ray comes, let me see if I can get it in there. The light ray comes in and is bounced and bounced back. And then some way, sometimes it's through a secondary mirror down through a hole here. Instead, you have a mirror more like this. And so the X-ray comes in as is, and is slightly bent downwards. And that is why we have these two sets of shapes here, where this one there and one there, where the light is, is uh, slightly bent. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I didn't have any um, examples of, of observations from radio telescopes uh, ready at hand. But I do have some of the, obviously I have some from the Hubble Space Telescope, but I also have some of the, the, the Chandra, at least uh, radio, uh, sorry, X-ray um, images. And this is the image that you see here. And you might think to yourself, <laughs> really? Really, Michael? Is that it? That, that blob? of light well you have to think of it like this what is it that emits x-rays well it is something that is quite hot and if you take something like a galaxy cluster we actually know now that one of the things in a galaxy cluster that is actually quite hot <clears throat> and emits in x-rays is the gas. So that is why you see this very, very large, big blob of, of light. And, and this is a combination of different wavelengths, different energies from the telescope. So there are three different energies, one in red, one in blue, and one in green. And that is why you also see these different colors here. They all represent different energies of the radiation. And if you wonder what this up here is, it's a standard measurement key that you can use in order to figure out the size of the object that you have here. Now, it's not an absolute size. It's a relative size. So this is <clears throat> how much this, uh, this line here is one arc second. No, sorry, one arc minute in, in, on the night sky. 
And we're going to talk about later what is an arc minute, what's, what is an arc second, how do you use it, and why do you use it, and all that. But you can see it as, as sort of a ruler, so we can figure out that, well, roughly I could say that from here to here, that's roughly, let's say, one, one two, three, four, four and a half, perhaps, arc minutes. And if you know the distance out to this object, then you can figure out what its size is on this scale, on this line here. So here we have the same, this is, sorry, this is the same observation here, albeit in one energy. I'm pretty sure I chose one energy, or maybe I combined them, I, sorry, I can't remember. But nevertheless, this is the same galaxy. You might notice that we have a big blob here, big source here, and a smaller, almost not visible source here. So, if we take uh, this X-ray emission that we got, and then superimpose it over the image of this galaxy cluster here, then we can certainly see that all of this red light here represents the distribution of the gas within the galaxy cluster. And it so happens to be that this was the galaxy cluster that I wrote my master thesis, thesis about. And as you can see, there's a lot of lensing in here that we used in order to find the mass of this object. And also, which is quite important, it would seem that this galaxy cluster here is very much elongated, almost like it looks like sort of this is a separate part and this is a separate part. And that seems actually to be the case that this is most likely a galaxy cluster that is either undergoing or has undergone a merging. That means two galaxy clusters that is sort of combined together. And one of the reasons, one of the ways that you can see this is that here we have one central cluster galaxy and uh, let me see here i think it is now here we have the other central cluster galaxy and the central cluster galaxy is the biggest most massive galaxy that you have in a cluster it's sort of the you could almost say it's the galaxy that all of the other galaxies is sort of trying to move towards the center of gravity almost all right, let's continue. So the final thing that we can sort of look for, and this is sort of the, the real sort of high end of, of emission, and it's gamma rays. And gamma rays actually happen in quite a lot, lot of cases. And one of the cases that you get gamma rays is when we have sort of a um, gamma ray burst. And we're going to talk more about what gamma ray burst is when we're going to talk about stars. But to put it short, a gamma ray burst is a very massive star. Very, very massive. Blue giant, super giant, blue super giant star. Normally what happens when we have a star, a big star that undergoes its final sort of transformation, if you will, which we call a supernova. What will happen usually is that if you have the star, let me see if I can get it like this. This is the star. <clears throat> Inside you have the core of the star. The core is emitting a lot of radiation outwards. Building a radiation pressure that wants to blow the star apart. On the other hand, we have all of these outer layers that really wants to squeeze the star together into nothingness, actually. Into a black hole, into a singularity. And it is this balance between the radiation and the gravitational pressure that keeps the star in shape. But what happens in the final parts of the star's life is that the core will stop emitting radiation. There's no more... Oh, that went my... Uh... Let me see if I can fix the webcam.
All right, it should be sort of relatively in focus. Let me just get the cam screen on so I can see. Yeah, it's okay in focus. All right. So yes, where was I? Yes, it was these massive stars. So what happens is that the core inside the star will stop emitting radiation because we have... Well, we're going to talk about what happens in the star. So let's just say the core will stop emitting radiation, meaning there's no outward force. So all of these outer layers come crushing onto the core of the star and they will squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it until it becomes rock solid. And that will create a thrust wave out through the outer layers that will sort of blow the outer layers apart. And in the middle you will have either what is called a Newton star or a black hole. And outward you will have this big cloud of the star that is sort of moving away from it with huge velocities. That is called a supernova. When we have a gamma ray burst, we have what is called a hypernova. And the current theory, as far as I remember it, last time I checked, that is, was that instead we have the same system. We have this big blue supergiant. And the core will st stop emitting radiation. <coughs> and these outer layers will come thrusting into it and pushing the core together, smaller, smaller, until it reaches what is called the Schwarzschild radius, and there it will keep collapsing indefinitely until it becomes a singularity. Now, usually uh, black holes made inside stars, they will rotate also. And because they are so powerful, they have so much gravity, they will suck uh, layers of the star into them. And that is when these, this material is sucked in around this rotating star, this rotating black hole, sorry, it will create what is called sort of a uh, spiral of matter out perpendicular to the, uh, to the, um, to the, uh, the rotation in both directions. And what is special about a hypernova is that all of these things the, this this spiraling, this this black hole creation, this uh, uh, sending out these waves, this um, oh, what are they called? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, uh, let's just call them um, spirals. Um, these spirals will come thrusting out of the sides of the stars, out through the outer layers. And they'll contain high amounts of gamma radiation, among other things. And that is what a telescope like the SWIFT here can, can detect. What is special about these gamma ray bursts is that, like I said, all of these things that happen inside with the core, they will happen before this shock wave can blow the star apart. So that's the special thing. And the reason why we are interested in, uh, in observing these gamma ray bursts here is to try to create a connection between sort of the, 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 the gamma ray emission that we see at first and what is called the optical afterglow from this, from this uh, happening, from this uh, hypernova. Finally, we have sort of a special part of, of, of what we can observe. It's not something that is sort of actively observed all the time. It's more like a, a continuous long-term observation where we try to make it more and more um, detailed. And the final satellite that I've heard that, that was sent up, the Planck satellite, was uh, meant to and did um, observe the cosmic microwave <laughs> wave background radiation. We also call it CMB. And... Um, we're going to talk more about what this um, cosmic microwave background radiation is when we're going into the final part of the, the cosmological part. Basically, it's the radiation we have from the, uh, from the universe, the most early radiation that we have. A relatively new thing that we have begun to observe, which is sort of completely past any way we have observed before in astronomy, up until now, 
All the observations that I've told you about has been in the electromagnetic spectrum. But a couple of years ago, scientists speculated if whether they could use the sort of bending of space-time itself, so use the space-time and, and, and gravity as the observational medium. And that gave rise to LIGO, uh, this Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And the way that works is quite fascinating, actually. I would very much recommend, uh, advise you to, to take, take it up and, and, and read about it, because it's really fascinating. But let me try to sort of uh, give it to you sort of in short terms. So we have two mirrors here that are hanged up. One of them is uh, sort of transparent, so the laser beam can go in and out of it. What will happen is that all of these uh, the, these laser beams that we have here, they will be put into this. This is called a beam splitter. So it will send some part of the laser beam through it and it will reflect, reflect some of it in the other direction. You could also call it a half mirror, if you will. So what happens is under normal circumstances is that this light goes in here and then the waves are bounced the, the light is bounced back and forth between the mirrors many many times until they escape and go th to this photo detector here so what happens when we have this normal setup here is that we have what is called destructive interference meaning that what the photo detector will see under normal circumstances will be nothing so one of the problems of observing, let's just take that. One of the problems of observing gravitational waves is that they work on the foundation, the, the meter stick that we use, what's called the metric itself. And imagine this. Let's say that I would begin to wobble just like, like a piece of pudding that you sort of bounce, so I would get wider and taller and wider and taller. And you had to measure that. We would always say, well, that's easy because I'll just take a, a meter stick and I'll say, oh, right now he's uh, 40 centimeters, now he's only 20 meters, now he's 80 centimeters. And then you could calculate it, right? No, because the problem here is that since we are dealing with space time and the metric, the meter stick itself would also wobble. So how the heck do we measure gravitational waves, waves that influence space-time itself? And this is where this invention here is very, very brilliant. So imagine that we have a gravitational wave coming in here. Now let's take an easy example. The gravitational wave will come in along this line, directly along this line. So you have to sort of imagine ripples in, in sort of in the fabric of space. So the ripples would make this distance here, these four kilometers, shorter and wider and shorter and wider and shorter and wider and shorter and wider, and shorter and wider all the time. But the distance here will not be because the waves are coming sort of perpendicular to them. So they would over only influence, well, they will influence it in, in minuscule sense, but, but the general picture in sort of to, to sort of put it sort of, sort of um, easily understood is that this distance here will not be affected in the same sense as this gravitational wave, this change of the metric. So what will happen is that this sink here between these two beams will change because this distance changes, but this does not. We can't measure this distance, even with the lasers, because the meter stick that we use, don't, they, they, that also changes. So this distance, no matter how we measure it with these lasers here, we'll say four kilometers, but since this distance is wobbling back and forth, the interference between these two laser beams will change. 
and when they change, the radiation goes through this mirror into the photo detector. <clears throat> and that is what you see here. As you can see, <clears throat> let's take this here, for example. This is from Hanford. This is from Livingston. As you can see, this is the theoretical curve that we should get. So let's just go from that. So when you have zero here, we have complete destructive interference. You can almost see it. it's what we have here. So what happened here is that this distance, some of one of these distances here changes in, in a certain amount so that we will have constructive interference destructive constructive destructive more and more and more because of this wobbling of the distance between them and when i say distance you have to again remember that i'm using simple terms because there is no change in distance there is no change because the meter stick that we use to measure the distance is the same so no matter what happens from this uh gravitational wave the distance between these will always remain four kilometers no matter how you put it but it is the difference between the way that they are influenced that will change this from destructive interference into constructive interference they would sort of get out of phase and in a, in in phase changing as uh, changing as you see it here <coughs> And that measurement made it so that we could actually figure out how big of a black, how, how big these two black holes, we, we estimate that it must be black holes that collided, how massive they are. I mean, this is completely fascinating and this is, this is a completely novel way for astronomy to measure things. I highly urge you to look, look into this experiment here, the LIGO experiment, how they do things because it is very 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 fascinating all right so let's take the other part let me just other part of astronomy and that is amateur astronomy so here you see my telescope here so i have a little camera here i have a filter wheel i have a search telescope or we call it up sort of a finder telescope and then i have my guiding telescope down here so Apart from the size and the way this is set up and all of those things, this is basically the same way as a modern uh, professional telescope would work. We have a main telescope to observe things. We have a secondary, smaller um, guide telescope to see things. The only role this little telescope, you can see it here, this little blue one, the only role this little telescope here, here, here has is to observe a certain star and then keep that star fixed at the, at the same center. That's the only thing it does. And if you look at this image here, you can see that I have a stellar map here. So this is uh, the uh, area that I'm observing at that point. This is the object that I have taken an image of. And this is the guide star. You can see this little blob here. This is the guide star that this telescope here keeps centered all the time. And as you can see, I'm sitting inside. It's at my parents because my telescope is down there. And I've just eaten something, <laughs> apparently. But this is the way that I uh, do things when I observe with my, my, my own telescope. And you could say this is something that is, well, depending on the size of your wallet, of course, is something that is access accessible to all of you. At any given time, you can buy a telescope, you can set it up, and you can observe. And if you want to, you can even buy some software, some hardware, and then you can observe with camera and take images and all that. And if you're really sort of going on the strong line here, you can also buy, like I said, standard photometric filters or even a, um, a spectrometer. And then you can do actual real science. And I mean it. It is real science. It may not be as detailed as the professional telescopes can do but it will be uh, to some extent just as real all right so uh, finally i would like to uh, part of this i would like to show you some of the images that i've taken with my own telescope uh 
different galaxies as you can see so you can actually get if you look at it you can actually get pretty okay details now if we didn't have an atmosphere then all of these stars that you see here should be very fine dots on the sky almost like these smaller ones that you see here around here and here even those are too big so perhaps like this one they should all look like this but this is because the sky is sort of making the stars sort of wobble all the way around and sort of the final product of that is sort of this blob that you see here so one of the other option that is for amateur astronomers is that we can go on to an online telescope service like iTelescope. And I have an account there and I still have some observational time. But here I have taken an image in a green filter and here I have taken it in a red filter. I can't remember whether, whether these are also combined with uh, narrow band filters. I'm going to talk more about what that is when we talk about real observations. But this is different ways to observe things. And I obviously lack the blue one here. There's also a blue color. But when you combine it all together, you get an image like this. Pretty neat, huh? <clears throat> all right, so let's take a quick peek at the physical properties, the astrophysics. So for instance, here we have some data, and, and this is data from gravitational lensing. This is actually from my, from my master thesis. So you can see we have gravitational lensing here. This is an arc. We also have some smaller images around, but these big arcs, they are the most easily observed ones. This is also part of, of this funny blob here, also part of the, uh, of the gravitational lensing. And you have to imagine or so, sort of see for yourself that this lensing here is a product primarily by this galaxy here, but influenced by all the other galaxies in that cluster. So one of the ways that I did uh, my master thesis was that I wanted to model the mass of this galaxy here. And uh, I'm not going to go very deeply into this at this point. We might take it up later. <clears throat> but since we know there is a connection between the mass in a, uh, in a, in a cluster like this and the amount of that these uh, stars, these galaxies, these are galaxies, sorry, not stars, these galaxies will be, uh, be lensed, then by knowing, sort of modeling the lensing, we can know how much mass there is inside the cluster. It's not as easy as that, because when you take this, uh, when you take this uh, model that we have, and you really want to solve for the images so you want to compare the error that you get what you do the, the easy way to do this is that we make a model putting in these images these images that you see we call them Im images let's call them lensed images then all of these are lensed images and we put in the central part of those as coordinates so we tell the model, here we have an image, and here we have an image, and here we have an image. And then the model will try to figure out what kind of mass distribution in, the, in, in this galaxy resembles uh, these, the position of these images. So obviously, we also give it the position of all of these galaxies in order for it to figure it out. What it does then is that it takes the easy way around, the, 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 the quick way to calculate this, is that it says, well, when we have this solution here, we have a galaxy here, and another solution is a galaxy here, and a galaxy here, and a galaxy here. And then it tries to sort of compare the, 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 sort of the, the di distribution of these different solutions to find the most, most uh, statistical probable solution. But you can... Hopefully see the problem here. Because what we are in reality doing, we are actually comparing apples to bananas, right? Because these are the apples that we gave the model 
and then we are sort of error correcting it with these bananas that we get from the model that the result what we really want to do is that we want to put in these bananas so these apples here and then we try to get some app some bananas from the model but using the bananas that we get from the model we'll try to predict where the images will be from these sorry where the apples will be from these bananas i hope you can follow this banana apple talk um so in essence what we do is we take the first observation that we did so we take all these images that we have create different models and then you figure out what is the most plausible solution in here then we take all of these solutions that we have here and then we try to reverse it so saying we have a galaxy here with this size and this mass and all that where would the images be placed and the problem with that is that this way to calculate things is what is called a non-linear equation so you might ask yourself what is a non-linear equation well let's take a linear equation a simple linear equation is that you say i have four plus four that is eight so i can reverse this around and say if i ha have eight and i subtract four <clears throat> then i get four in a non-linear system you can do it easily one way so you can say well i have four plus four that's eight but non-linear and try to follow this, this even it's a bit weird in a non-linear system you could also take say well i want to subtract eight from four uh, sorry four from eight and then you could get zero or 16 or 500 or in infinite so the problem here is that in an in a non-linear system you can go from you can go one way but you can't go the other in a linear system you can go you can say that there is a connection between the the input and the result so you can take the result and then you can get the input but in a non-linear system you cannot take the input and get the result and then take that result and then find your way back to the input the input can change or if you reverse it the results will change depending on how you see it so in order to solve this little annoyance here is is the way that we create a tons of different models tens of thousands of models all getting all sorting well first we need to make sure that all of the images that we get are uh, uh, the number of images that we get from the model is even correct when we have models that give the correct set of images we need to figure out which of those models are closest to the original images that we put in and then we make some statistical calculation over which model we then get is the most probable all right so let's continue so the model construction is that we put in some parameters of values it's a parameterized model so we have a profile in this case it is a this is a this is a profile over the distribution of mass in a galaxy obviously you could say most of it would probably be dark matter so you could, could you could call it a dark matter profile but it is a mass profile you give it the center of the mass you give it a proposed ellipticity you give an angle position so if you have an ellipse right you can sort of move it around like this and that's the angle position then you give it a core radius i'm not going to go into deeply what that is that's a, a radius of the core and then we have a cut radius and that's sort of the the area where we say we have lost enough of the mass that we can we call that a cut radius a certain amount of the mass that is sort of dissipated if you will it's not really dissipated but if you sort of you can imagine that if you, if you have a galaxy then the further you come out the, the less mass there will be and then you have a certain definition that we call a cut radius then we have a velocity dispersion within the, this this uh, this um, profile, and finally we have the distance, the redshift. <clears throat> then we can uh, um, try to optimize some of the values, so we put in some limits. And for this particular profile here, I have only put in the cut radius, which is sort of inside these boundaries. 
and the velocity dispersion. So all, the, all of the other values are kept fixed. And the same for this profile here, as you can see, different position, different uh, different uh, values, but there's still also a uh, cut radius and velocity dispersion. That's the only thing that I optimize for here. There are many more parameters in this model, not those, these two. This is just an example. Then we have images we put in here. So we have uh, we can we could actually give if we wanted to, we could sort of give the just like with the galaxy with the profile, we could say, well, is the image elliptical? But in this case, we just assume, if you will, and that seems to work pretty well, that all of these images have a size of one in either direction. And obviously there's no rotation angle then. And then we have the uh, redshift here. So for these three images, it's 3.238. 6.145 and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Similarly, we have some galaxies that we put into the model. In this case, we also have center. We have an ellipticity, no ellipticity here. And that turns out that actually for galaxies, it seems that the, uh, that the, um, the dark matter halo is almost in all cases circular. So we can, we can easily, um, approximate all these galaxies with a circular um, mass profile. And finally, we put in the, uh, the luminosity, the standard luminosity of the galaxy. So this is the magnitude, if you will. I think it's the AB magnitude we, we used here. And then finally, we have, uh, I think it's a, it's a number that's not used, and that's why it just has one in here. The redshift is not defined in here because the program that I used, Lens Tool, assumes that all of these galaxies that we have, these are sort of uh, uh, minor galaxies in the cluster, they are at the same, um, they are all at the same redshift and preferably at the same redshift as the cluster itself. <clears throat> and then we start the optimization and uh, <coughs> Sorry. We wait a very long time. This such an optimis optimization here can easily take a week, something like that. And then we get some results. So one of the first first things that we could do is that we can use the results from the model to estimate the mass of the cluster. And this is a cumulative mass. So as you can see, we have the, the distance from 10 kiloparsecs all the way out to 400 kiloparsecs. And as you can see, the mass, it increases because, well, it's cumulative. So we take sort of, if you imagine, we take a part of the galaxy and says, how much mass do we have in here? Then we increase the radius and say, how much mass do we have in here? Plus the one that we just calculated and so forth and so on all the way out. The lines that you see here in the down here are the position, the relative position from the center that we chosen here uh, to the uh, images that we used. So we have some that are relatively close. And the reason why we put those in is that we say, well, we can't really make good estimates of the mass of a galaxy uh, cluster outside the the furthest images that we have. So this part here is more unreliable than the mass uh, that we have, uh, the estimate that we have in here. But we can say for <clears throat> this galaxy here, it's roughly 10 to the, I think it's the 11th, 12, something like that. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, four times ten to the fourteenth. Um, uh, what was it? Um, solar masses. So it's a it's a pretty big galaxy cluster, and as you can see, because we have the different parts of the uh, galaxy, in, we can take the total mass. Then we have something down here called the halo mass. The halo mass is sort of 
the big halo of the entire uh, galaxy cluster again if we in this course talk more about um the, the, the what how we calculate these things how we model uh these uh, galaxy cluster masses with gravitational lensing we're going to talk more about what are the different halos and finally sort of this is the cluster halo and these lines here represent the uh the, the galaxy part the galaxy halo so all of the galaxies here as you can definitely see that the cluster halo is is for the most part the most massive part of the entire cluster we can also find the mass density of the uh, <coughs> of the cluster and this particular mass density here suggests that like i said this is a merging cluster it is also called a indication of a non-relaxed cluster. If the cluster was relaxed, it would have sort of a more linear um, mass density going all the way, sort of linear descent in mass in mass density from the inner parts of the galaxy to the outer parts of the galaxy. But instead, here we have to about one hundred kiloparsecs. A relatively uh, equal amount of mass density so the density of the cluster doesn't change within here the mass density is the same and then as we go further out in the cluster it suddenly sort of slightly goes down we also have some parameter values and when we optimize for parameter values we have to consider uncertainties and this is what you can see here uh, all of these are different uncertainties, so we have them in three different um, certainty um, areas. We have, uh, I think it's uh, 68, 95, and 90, 99 uh, percent confident interval. <clears throat> and then we have sort of the, the, the uncertainty on the values. You can see these. Uh, this is the most likely value, the dot here. And then these lines out here represent the uncertainty. One of the things that we plot this for is to figure out are there any of these values that seem to be correlated um, with each other? And there are some if you look. These, for example, this one here and this one here. And why is it correlated? Well, as you can see, this is the uh, sort of the um, certainty spectrum, the certainty area of this uh, um, parameter value here. In this case, it's the core radius of halo 2 compared with uh, the delta of the halo, halo 2. I can't remember what that value is. But nevertheless, as you can see, since this is the, the probability, this value here down here is, is probable, but this value here is also equally probable. So I can move these values back and forth here and still stay within the same probability. And the same here for the position in X and Y for halo 2. I can move that from this value here all the way up to this value here. As long as I change both values equally in both directions, I will get the same probability. <clears throat> and the same down here, the uh, X and Y of Halo 1, the same issue. So we have sort of some values in here in this model that we can't say with a, ve with a very high degree of certainty what really is compared to something like this. Here I, I can obviously go a little bit around inside this dark area here and and see uh that in principle these are just equally as as um as probable but the values are not correlated if i change one i cannot also change the other in the same direction and get the same probability not sort of over the entire spectrum that is i hope this makes sense for you if it if it doesn't it's really okay because like i said this is just an introduction to what i will uh do to you if you if you follow this uh course 
We can also get a visual representation of the mass distribution. So here we have the model data in white. This is from the lens model. I haven't really talked about what it's called, but it's called a lens model. <clears throat> As you can also see, we have something called RA in degrees and DEC in degrees. This is called rect ascension, and this is called declination. It's something that we will talk about in the next lecture. And uh, it sort of is sort of a uh, roadmap. It's sort of a, a coordinate system on the sky in order to figure out where things are. And here we have the mass distribution again of the, the cluster. But this time here we have all of the little galaxies. You can see all of these little dots. These are the galaxies put into the halo cluster. This very elongated elliptical shape is the halo cluster and all of these smaller ones are the ga galaxy clusters here we only have the galaxy cluster uh, sorry the halo clusters but instead i have over overlaid the red one which is the distribution of the gas and as you can see the distribution of the gas follows the distribution of the halo mass which is fortunate because a substantial part of the mass of a galaxy cluster is its gas all right, that's it. I have been online here for one hour and 31 minutes. I hope I don't have bored you to death with this. I hope that you can see past all of the talk and all of the numbers and see why astronomy might be a very interesting subject for you. And, and if you would like to, uh, to, uh, to, to know more about astronomy, then I will try to be here uh, at the exact same time next week and I'll see you there and then we will uh, we'll have some fun we'll learn some stuff and I will own my skills as a teacher and you will own your skills as a student all right see you later on bye bye